introduce our first uh, presenter today, Melanie Reese, who is the executive director of Older Women Embracing Life, OWEL. The founder of OWEL was Carolyn Massey. I would, I would come to know this powerful advocate over the years and would invite her to join us when we were invited to provide testimony before the US Senate and Congress and at many of our local, national and global conferences. Melanie continues to embody the vision and mission of OWL, which seeks to relate a community of women who are living full, productive and happy lives despite the challenges of aging with HIV AIDS. With passion, purpose, and spirited joy, she participates in the design and implementation of projects, programs that revitalize the physical, emotional, and spiritual and mental health of women in the communities where OWEL provides services. Melanie was recently appointed to the Board of International Community of Women Living with HIV AIDS of North America. She is an active member of many HIV AIDS organizations, including the Johns Hopkins Institute of Clinical and Translational Research Community and the Advisory Council, and the Maryland Coalition on HIV AG and Long-Term Care. Melly wrote a commentary for HIV clinical care recently, and it's entitled and really embodies the spirit of today's meeting patient perspective, what aging patients want with HIV, want their providers to know. Melanie, it's yours. Um, thank you, Steve, for that uh, wonderful um, uh, introduction. Um, uh, yes, Owell has worked with uh, Stephen on uh, when a CREA was just a CREA. Um, ACREA was all about the um, quality of care and quality of life for those of us living with HIV as we age. He recognized that early on, and so did Dorcas Baker, who is the president of OWL's board, and um, two other women who co- Together they um, co-founded OWL. Um, Dorcas was a um, research nurse and uh, one of her patients asked, do you know of any support groups that have the cares and concerns that I have as an older woman? And uh, Dorcas couldn't find any and so she had seen a video of five alive um, uh, older women living with HIV. And one day she met one in the clinic waiting room. So, oh well, Older Women Embracing Life was born. Oh well, um, participates in health fairs, community events, church, events, um, telling our stories about what it is uh, like to live with HIV as we're aging and how um, we turned a diagnosis that at one time was a death sentence into an opportunity to empower and embrace uh, women who are um, living with HIV and we also serve women who are vulnerable to acquiring HIV um, because we're about treatment and prevention. They go hand in hand, you can't separate that. And um, we um, are engaged with Johns Hopkins University um, on um, with several health studies um, on the mind, the brain, um, uh, a current one I'm working with is a women's study um, that um, hopes to change behaviors 
of women who either for coping uh, with uh, certain life circumstances, they excessive drinking, um, alcohol. We want them to reduce their drinking to safer levels and hopefully um, get them to a point where they're willing to um, stop drinking. Um, as far as research, uh, women have been underserved in the research arena when it comes to uh, those of us who are living with HIV. It's getting better, but the steps are small and uh, we want it to be more robust. Um, we participated with Dr. Harahan from the University, Johns Hopkins University on a checkup study, which was a study to uh, engage women living with HIV who were 18 years old and older to encourage them to keep, uh, make appointments and keep appointments for um, their pap smears. Uh, women with HIV tend to not go for um, uh, GYN appointments. And so uh, the Henrietta Lacks Memorial Lecture um, honors um, CBOs that work with Hopkins to better the health of the community. And OL won the 2018 um, Henrietta Lacks um, Memorial Lecture Award um, for our involvement in that study. And um, Henrietta Lacks, she died from cervical cancer um, in 1951. And so our study was to help women to keep their pap smear appointments and get checked regularly. We also um, got involved with, um, or we initiated OWL and the Baltimore City Health Department's um, HIV prevention group in starting uh, a work group on HIV aging and long-term care because we did not want what happened in the beginning of the epidemic to occur at the end of our lives as we are aging and living longer. Uh, we did not want um, patients who are in assisted living, nursing homes, rehabilitation center to uh, experience stigma, discrimination, um, not getting um, their medications um, to them um, in a timely manner. And uh, we as people living with HIV, we're not HIV. We are a whole person that happens to have HIV as one of our um, chronic conditions um, that we live with. And um, we want all the healthcare system to recognize that they have to treat the whole person. And the whole person incorporates mental health, um, physical health, spiritual health, and um, um, being buddies to other people who are aging and um, living in uh, alone in isolation. And the COVID uh, pandemic has really uh, emphasized the um, not healthy um, occurrences that occur when you are in your own place alone and do not have uh, technology, uh, bandwidth, um, internet, and the uh, a computer, a smartphone, 
because those are the ways that we engage with each other, attend support groups and meetings because we're all doing it remotely. And um, I also have to mention that there are a number of PLWHA um, organizations that put together a document calling Demanding Better. It's an HIV federal policy agenda by people living with HIV. We're in the end of the epidemic, the HIV epidemic, and we've been so for some time now. But the people, those of us living, I've been living with HIV 22 years. They left us out of the um, ending the epidemic uh, planning and decision making. And uh, I asked um, Dr. Fauci when he presented the um, ending the epidemic plan, uh, do you realize that even when you end the epidemic, that there are people who are already living with HIV that need robust services and care systems that are different from what you have fashioned in your um, uh, funding, um, F, uh, funding um, proposals. And so um, we have to advocate for whole person care. And the Demanding Better has five areas of recommendation on the federal level. But remember, federal level, there's state level, there's city level, there's a, uh, neighborhood levels that this has to um, uh, trickle down from. And the issue area one, concretely elevate meaningful involvement of people living with HIV and disproportionately impacted communities in the HIV response. That's massive. Issue area two, proactively create an affirming human rights environment for people living with HIV, which would address stigma, eliminate HIV criminalization, and halt um, molecular HIV surveillance. Issue three, addressing inequities in the federal response, attend to racial and gender disparities. Issue area four, add sex workers and immigrants living with HIV as priority populations throughout the federal response. And the number five issue area is the biggest part of this is affirmatively commit to improving quality of life for people living with HIV. That is the advocacy agenda that we must take to the streets, take to your uh, local government, your state government and the federal government because yes, we are living longer but we want to not just live longer, we want to have a robust um, quality of life. And to do that, there are going to have to be um, opportunities for people to be able to age in place and not have to go to assisted living or a nursing home where um, they're unfamiliar, don't know the when you live at home and it is safe, it's affordable, um, it helps the outcomes of your health. Um, and so that's very, very important. And uh, we're very involved with the Maryland um, Coalition on HIV and Aging. And uh, we're working on policy, legislation, curriculum, standards of care because the assisted living, nursing homes, 
research, I mean, uh, rehabilitation centers, um, they don't realize that we're coming down the pike and going to probably have to use their facilities. And they need to know the truth about HIV, especially how it's transmitted and not transmitted, and that um, there's nothing for them to fear from being in our room, picking up our um, uh, trays, uh, administering any kind of uh, medication that is needed. And um, if someone has to be bathed, that they are uh, able to do that without fear because bathing someone does not um, put you at risk for acquiring HIV. And so there's a whole uh, plethora of um, advocacy work that needs to be done on behalf of those of us living and aging with HIV. And one thing we cannot forget, those who were born with HIV, they may not be 50 and older, most of them are 40, between uh, 25 and 40 years old. They are aging with HIV. Even though their chronological age does not match what we consider um, HIV and aging, their body systems have only known HIV. And so the consequences of living to 30, 35 are very impactful on someone's life. And we have got to support advocating for them to receive specialized services and resources to provide those services. And so advocacy is, is so important. Um, advocacy, you can call representatives, you can write representatives, you can um, ask to attend uh, like the city council uh, uh, meeting, you can um, go when the session is open to uh, your state um, legislation and ask to uh, be heard in sessions that are covering areas that uh, impact those of us living with HIV um, to speak before the committees. And um, like Steve talked about, um, Caroline, Caroline uh, Massey uh, with him to testify in front of Congress. Well, those st things still need to exist. And uh, what services are needed by those of us aging with HIV, those need to come from us. We need to tell what it is that we need and then the providers and the health system and the case managers, the social workers, the pharmacists, the, everybody has to work together to make sure these become a reality and not just a passing expression. Um, and uh, we are very heavily impacted by social determinants of health. Most of us did not expect to age with HIV, but biomedical uh, treatments uh, improved and we are able to live in to age. Um, and uh, we have to let them know what it is we need and what it is it that we want. And then the powers that be that controls the appropriations need to open their purses and make sure that funding is given to we as HIV, living with HIV and aging we have multiple co-occurring chronic conditions, some of which are 
medication uh, induced. Um, some because we most of us are living at poverty or just above poverty. Uh, the nutrition that we have. Um, I don't know about any of you, but every time you visit the grocery store, the prices have gone up and the amount of food that you get for what you're paying for is less. And uh, so nutrition, exercise, uh, those are very important. Uh, mental health, um, uh, frailty, um, those are so uh, needed. The geriatric needs to learn the HIV language and the HIV um, people need to learn the geriatric um, language because they have to meet in the middle to make sure that we live quality lives with healthy outcomes. And um, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, when I wrote my commentary, uh, one of the things that I um, spoke about was our primary care doctors, nurses, they're retiring and we are subject to getting new um, providers who may not have been around to experience what it was like in the beginning of HIV. And by the way, women have been in, impacted directly and um, affected by HIV since the beginning of HIV. We didn't just show up late to the game. We were there from the beginning. And um, education, education, education. Um, when doctors and nurses, if all they've learned about HIV comes from a textbook, that's not going to cut it. They need to get some personal experiences. If they oh. have to watch YouTube or uh, a movie uh, or something to see what it was like then and make sure that that does not occur again um, as we age. Um, so um, also uh, mentioned that I'm uh, a board member for the International Community of Women Living with HIV in North America. Um, in doing the work that we're doing, we have done programs with the Caribbean uh, islands and um, their uh, experiences with stigma and discrimination are far worse than what we experience in here. And it's hard to imagine it can be worse, but it is. And so globally, we have to think globally and not just locally or nationally, because wherever somebody is living with HIV, we need to step in and step up and help them to be advocates for themselves first, then for their families, and then for the community of people living with HIV. And um, it's very important. And uh, I tell you, working with the ladies in the Caribbean um, has given me new zest for advocacy, for education, for um, research, um, and um, be thankful for what we have here in the United States. But even that is not equal because our Southern states are 
lacking behind those of us that are in cities, rural areas, and even the cities in the South are uh, behind those of us in uh, the Northern part or the Northeast, Northwest, North, Midwest, uh, in terms of um, uh, appropriate and uh, care and treatment and uh, in the rural areas, um, the digital divide is even greater than it is in the city. But we have, to, we have our work cut out for us. Um, we cannot be afraid of stepping up and speaking to people who have the power and the pen to write uh, robust um, RFAs and who have uh, influence on appropriations and getting resources that are needed for those of us that are aging, which includes the perinatally um, impacted um, um, uh, persons living with HIV because they're not 50 and older, but they need similar services as those of us that are 50 and older. And we have to make sure that that happens. Um, we can't leave anybody behind. And uh, the uh, molecular HIV surveillance is the current way uh, of tracking new infections. Uh, but the community is up in arms because until um, criminalization of HIV is eliminated. That tracking could cause someone to have to be entangled in the criminal justice system, and we cannot have that. And um, living with HIV, even if you're doing well, you're virally suppressed, and you're not um, having a lot of um, uh, issues with uh, your medications and uh, your physical and mental uh, well-being, um, we don't need anything added to create stress, fear, and uh, stigma. Um, to occur to those of us who are living with HIV. Thank you so much. That was, I think, a really great overview um, about what the activism landscape um, and kind of what are the issues that are facing us now as um, folks continue to age with HIV. We have quite a few questions in the chat box. Um, many folks do want to hear uh, where they can uh, get that demand better piece and then the, the different principles you were reading. Okay, um, that document, Demanding Better, is on the US PLHIV Caucus website. Um, let's see if I have it in here. I can also work on getting it. You said it's okay. the US PLHIV Caucus website? Yes. Okay, I will definitely work on on posting it. And so it's both of those things that you had mentioned. We're, yes, the demanding better. Okay. Absolutely. And um, then yeah, and then the principles that you were reading off earlier, is that available somewhere? Um, that is the uh, demanding better. Uh, oh, uh, I see. I see. Recommendations. Okay. And awesome. the rest of the document speaks to those five issues, awesome. which, which is interesting because I call this, somebody I guess I saw Denver principles, I call demanding better, the Denver principles 2.0. So uh, it uh, enhances the human 
um, and quality of life issues that were presented in the Denver Principles in 1983. And this document um, goes into uh, structural racism, uh, gender um, issues, um, because even though we're doing better, we aren't there yet where um, uh, people can um, freely access care and treatment and have no issues with housing and, uh, and care issues. Got but it. There's lots of work to be done. And uh, as long as I am living and breathing, I am going to be an active activist because I am not just in it for myself and my well being. It's for women of color because we have been left out of the equation long enough and uh, we are still climbing the ladders to get the. the robust uh, uh, research. I belong to the Maryland um, Coalition, the U Equals U Coalition. And with the um, International uh, Community of Women Living with HIV, we are working for U Equals U for women um, because women of childbearing age should be able to breastfeed their babies without fear of criminalization, without fear of their babies being taken from them um, because of their want to bond with their babies. And um, so we are actively working on that. Um, uh, we have the Milky Movement, uh, and uh, yeah, women were left out of the U equals U equation, uh, and so we're making sure we are um, up front and center in in those conversations. Awesome, I I really appreciate all of the work that you're doing. I completely agree that. Um, you know, Black women and other women of color who are living with HIV, aging with HIV are often excluded and that really needs to change. And it really, you know, there's a saying in the disability, in like the disability rights movement, nothing about us without us. And so really exactly. demanding that. Yes. Absolutely. That is correct. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, someone else had asked in the chat, uh, they were familiar with a, um, a geriatric pilot program at a uh, University of Maryland Medical Center in Baltimore. Um, yes. They were wondering if you know of a little bit more about that or any other entities. I do know about, um, for instance, Golden Compass, which is more primary yes. care focus. Yes, in it's San primary Francisco. care focus. Um, the strong um, program, it's a pilot study. Um, that they're in their last year of funding and reapplied that they got funding from Gilead aging positively and they do assessments on um, you know are you strong uh, are you frail uh, do you have problems with your gait do you fall um, strength they use those um, geriatric uh, um, assessments um i don't know why my mind is... their assessment screenings yes. melanie yes. assessments and screen yes. yes honey don't worry we got you <laughs> so um yeah and they provide durable medical equipment which is something else that needs to be addressed for those of us aging with hiv because it's not just a risk wrist braces or knee braces, ankle braces or back braces, hearing aids, vision. Um, our vision changes more rapidly as we age. Oral health. Um, 
uh, dentures and partials and all, we need to have them updated more regularly because our there are changes in our jaw structure, our bone structures, and uh, it makes it difficult for us to talk and eat. Um, and nutrition is very, very important. But if you have to have a soft or a practically liquid diet, um, it becomes boring. And um, yes, I just saw something about sexual health. Yes, sex never gets old. Um, it can become different as we age because I don't swing on chandeliers anymore. Uh, I'm not acrobatic or whatever, but sex is still great. Um, and uh, providers need to ask comprehensive sexual health questions for everyone who comes into their office or is on their screen. Um, and uh, I thought I had the button, but I uh, guess. That's all right. But, um, yeah. We have, you know, two minutes left. Um, I totally wish that could just chat with you all day. Um, you're absolutely right about all these care gaps, especially with, you know, Medicare, for example, which a lot of older people yeah. and people yeah. with disabilities, yeah, it doesn't cover hearing, it doesn't cover dental and that, you know, I think there's a lot of folks working on that. So I guess just to wrap up, um, I know we've talked a lot about challenges um, and also um, certain victories. And, you know, I just wanna hear more about what you're, what, what's making you feel hopeful right now when everything just seems so overwhelming. What makes me hopeful? The fact that I know a community of people who are located across the globe and locally and nationally care. They really care and have their heart and soul into seeing that things change. I work with PWN USA, um, the International Community of Women Living with HIV North America and East Africa and the Caribbean and Canada uh, who want better and are demanding better. That gives me hope. That gives me hope um, that there are still those out there that want to be involved. Um, even those, who, I use a rollator to walk around and uh, I would still march. Um, I get on phone calls. Um, I use my voice. I stand up in small, or big arenas to say, hey, wait a minute. I didn't hear anything about women. I didn't hear anything about um, uh, job readiness uh, because some of us frankly have to work to supplement our um, social security because that's not a living <laughs> substance <laughs> on uh, Medicare or um, Social Security, SSI, SSDI, or SSA. Uh, no, you can't live on those funds alone. So some of us have been out of the workforce for quite some time. Well, we need training so that we can get some extra money flowing into our um, bank account so that we can subsist uh, um, subsist well. You know, don't have to worry about uh, electricity, bg e water uh, get cut off, or your refrigerator's bare. Uh, so there's plenty of work to do, and that gives me hope. Yes, yeah, absolutely. All of the kind of, I think, um, you know, in public health, we... To, to wrap it up, we do see kind of a big trend toward how, you know, health is not just about your viral load or your CD4 count or other things like that. It's, you know, all the things we need to stay healthy. Um, this was a great conversation. Thank you again, Melanie, Reese. Um, I'm really looking forward um, to seeing what else OL continues to do um, under your leadership. And um, 